Hello, everyone. My name is Marina, and I am a PhD student at NYU. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work I've been doing for secure software distribution. So why do we care about secure software distribution? This is an attack vector that's being used a lot, um, especially recently, to distribute malware to large numbers of systems all at once. This includes the recent SolarWind attack, which relied on software updates, as well as a wider um, software supply chain attack to distribute that malware. In addition, the, mal sorry, the Flame malware um, was distributed through Microsoft Windows Update, not Petya, which, which caused all kinds of outages in hospitals and major companies, also spread through software updates. More close to this community, the Docker Hub password database compromised was part of you know, a Docker Hub compromise. And many images were, were compromised there, although this was very much mitigated by an earlier version of this work. In addition, all these attacks have huge economic damages, including this one example where uh, malware distributed over software updates in South Korea caused almost $800 million of damages. So what are we going to do about this? So in the cloud, in this space, I've been working on the Node v2 effort, which is an effort to create a more broadly used secure distribution system for registries by building onto the work done in Notary and addressing some of the limitations of that system. These include avoiding trust on first use for keys and really consolidating the key management to make it much easier to use and use securely. Hosting metadata directly on repositories to avoid users having to run additional services in order to use secure distribution. Um, this space is especially interesting from um, this perspective in, in the way that it's different from traditional software repository systems in that we, have, we also have to secure ephemeral clients, which don't have any state on them that we can use to store information to be used as part of this update process, or update or distribution process, sorry. We also have shared repositories with private data, and you don't want this private data to leak to other users through the use of metadata. And finally, we have this idea of scalability, where some registries have, have millions of images, and we want to make sure that the security solution we have scales to registries even when they are that large. So to do so, we have a threat model. That's the, you know, the place to start with how to design a security solution. So in our threat model, we Looking at these previous compromises that I've talked about, we kind of make this assumption that it's not a question of, you know, if your repository or your registry will be compromised. It's a question of what will you do when that happens and, and how protected will you be when that happens? Because even these companies with huge, huge security budgets and people focusing on this, this still happens to them. And so we, we want to make sure that even, even when this happens, we're protected. So we assume that the attacker can compromise some, but not all signing keys, and that they can have control of the registry for some period of time. And in addition, the, the attacker is able to watch traffic to or from the registry and alter this traffic. And the goal in the system is to prevent users from installing a package that doesn't have a currently valid signature. This includes, of course, arbitrary software installation or when the attacker can install arbitrary malware onto users' machines. But it also includes things like rollback attacks where the attacker is able to convince users to install a previous version or a version that no longer has a valid signature or maybe was has a signature with a revoked key, any of the situations we want to avoid, as well as a few more subtle attacks and ways that the attacker can try and convince the user to install a non-optimal um, version of the software. So the first approach that I'll talk about um, for how to secure software distribution in general is using cryptographic signatures. And these are a piece of probably any system for secure distribution that you'll see, but this is kind of looking at, at, looking at systems that kind of focus on the cryptographic signature aspect. And so what these signatures do is they attest that the person with the private key who signs an image has access to this private key and they attest to the contents of the image. Um, in TLS, these, this is often done through um, keys that are stored on a repository or on a server somewhere, and then images are put there, and the user can make sure that, that the image that they're downloading is the same one that's hosted on the repository. And this could also include um, keys that are controlled by individual developers or individual 
you know, other machines that, that develop code, like CI/CD systems. And, um, and then these individual developers, I'll just call them developers for simplicity, um, can sign, the, sign an image or an artifact locally and then upload that artifact and the signature attached to it up to a registry. The downside with this, this approach is that whoever has control of the keys in the system has full control over the system and can, and can sign arbitrary software or arbitrary malware, as the case may be, and convince users to install it. So if, the, if these keys are on a repository or a registry, um, I'm using those terms a little bit interchangeably, but um, it's basically the whatever server you're hosting your code for the purpose of this talk, that's what I mean by either of those terms. Um, but yeah, if an attacker compromises this repository there, and there's an online key on this repository, they're able to sign any, any images and give them to the client. If um, the developer controls these signatures um, an attacker, and an attacker compromises a developer key, they're also able to sign arbitrary images. And this is in part because users don't have a good way to know which signatures to trust and which signatures to trust for which particular images. And so they often have a, a key ring. And if any key in that ring is compromised, it can be used just to sign arbitrary malware and they'll then trust and install it. And in this system, there's often um, no good ability to revoke keys and ensure timely revocation of keys. So as a quick summary of um, those attacks that I just talked about, if a developer key is compromised, the malicious um, developer key can be trusted by all users, including even if, you know, to, to sign malware. If a repository or registry is compromised, the attacker can alter content and show older versions of images that were previously signed by developers, um, even if that, those developer signatures are no longer valid. If a mirror is compromised, it has pretty much the same abilities as a registry to alter content or show old versions. And then if the um, attacker is acting as like a machine in the middle or on the network, they can save and replay old signatures even after a vulnerability is discovered or the software is otherwise um, no longer signed. So next I'll introduce the update framework or a TUF as we like to call it, which is a framework for secure software updates that I participate in the research and development for that was designed with compromise resilience in mind to kind of address some of these issues. Um, as part of that, key revocation and delegation are first class primitives. They're really built in from, from the bottom to make sure that they're always used and they're always easy to use in any of these compromise situations. And because of all the additional security, focus on security, we also, decide, we also in, in TUF focus on this idea of invisible usability, which means that even though there's a lot of security going on behind the scenes, the users don't need to know exactly what's happening unless something goes wrong. So for the most part, they, all they know is that they're downloading software and it's being verified. They don't, like they, don't, they, they, would, they don't have to specifically do a lot of steps. It's all part of an automated process, trying to make this easier for both developers and users of software. And using TUF, and I'll go into a lot more detail about how TUF works in a minute, but I just wanted to summarize those same attacks um, here at the beginning. So if a developer key is compromised and in a system using TUF, um, only the files that that developer key is specifically, like the, only the, the artifacts that are specifically assigned to that developer could be compromised um, using this developer key. And that's only if a threshold of developer keys are compromised. And I'll go into what that means in a minute. And in addition, developer keys can be revoked by more trusted roles at any time. If a repository or registry is compromised in a system using TUF, the attacker would be able to, to a limited extent, show old metadata, but this is mitigated a little bit by a client's verification that any metadata they see is newer than metadata already on the system. And this is also recoverable using delegation from more trusted roles. Um, for mirrors, the, um, the mirrors actually don't have any trust in a system using, using TUF, and so the mirrors aren't able to change any content without detection. And then somewhat similarly, a machine in the middle or attacker on the network is not able to alter any, anything, and any um, old signatures will be detected by the clients, and so they can't be used to install old versions of the software. 
So how does stuff do this? So it uses a few principles um, in order to achieve kind of this level of security. The first principle is this idea of separation of duties, where any one person or any one signing key um, is only trusted to do a certain set of things within the system. And the way this works is it starts with a root of trust or a root role, which serves as the root of trust for the system. And this role then delegates or provides the public keys for some other top level roles. So these are the timestamp role, which provides a notion of timeliness, which ensures that, for example, um, revocations and metadata are always um, timely and consistent with what's currently on the registry or repository. A snapshot role, which um, ensures consistency of images. And then a top level targets role, which um, is where you start to provide actual Im information about the artifacts and images on the, the registry. And this targets role is also able to provide further delegations to other individual developers or teams um, to prevent any, any key sharing even at that level to make sure that um, each key is only trusted for the specific piece of the system that um, it is attesting to. Next, we have threshold signatures. Um, the idea here is that, um, for especially for more high security roles, um, the role isn't trusted unless a threshold of signatures all signs the same piece of metadata for that role. So in this example here, the target's metadata isn't trusted unless three out of the four keys for that role have all signed the same metadata. And this just makes sure that um, if there are different people trusted for the role, they all sign it. And it would, take, uh, it would take, in this example, three key compromises for an attacker to be able to sign arbitrary target's metadata. Next, we have explicit and implicit revocation of keys. So the implicit revocation of keys is just that all keys in the system have a, a time, sorry, a, a timestamp, and they all they're all they expire after a certain period of time. And the explicit revocation means that any higher level role in the system can explicitly sign new metadata that removes a signature, that removes a public key for a lower level role. So any key in the system can be explicitly revoked at any time. And, users, and because of the notion of timeliness, users will know right away when a key has been revoked and they'll be prevented from using a revoked key in their verification. And finally, Tuff minimizes the risk using offline keys. So for especially, again, these more high security roles, especially the root role and also the top level targets role, um, Tuff encourages um, users of the system to use offline keys for these roles. Because as, as we've mentioned, one of the assumptions in the system is that you know, your servers will be compromised at one point or another. So if these keys are not on any servers, if they're just you know, exist physically in some lockbox somewhere, an attacker using just the internet can't possibly compromise them. And they would need to do some kind of you know, Ocean's, level, Ocean's 11 heist kind of you know, physical attack to actually get access to these keys, which just really increases the security of your system. So putting it all together, um, when there's a compromise of your system, Tuff um, protects it using a combination of all of these properties. So um, the timestamp and snapshot role are, are both on the registry or repository. So if the registry repository is compromised, these two roles would probably also be compromised. But in this situation, the actual targets roles and the actual keys used to sign images aren't compromised. And so the attacker isn't able to change any of that information. And also the root role is able to be is can be used to revoke the timestamp and snapshot roles and kind of reestablish trust in the system once you get back control of your registry um, without any manual intervention onto client systems to kind of reestablish trust. It's all kind of an automatically done after the attack. And then if any single developer key is compromised, only that one package or that one thing that the developer was trusted to sign would be compromised. And again, that can be um, revoked by any of the higher level targets keys all the way up to the root role, which could just revoke all of them if need be. Although probably a lower level one should revoke it first, just to prevent um, the overhead there. And in addition to all of these kind of existing features of TUF and kind of this whole kind of philosophy around secure software distribution, in order to kind of adapt this more for the Node UV2 effort and the 
container registry specific scenarios. Um, we have a couple of new features that I'm gonna talk about here today. So the first of these is client pinning of targets keys. So the idea here is to reduce trust in the registry by allowing the client to define the, the I'm sorry, the public keys that um, they would like to trust in order to sign specific targets files. Um, this means that the, even the root role um, on the registry or repository itself doesn't have, won't be able to override this without the client knowing about it. So the client will know, um, you know, whenever this key is changed, whenever a new developer is signing it, whenever something changes like that. And this can be especially useful at, in open source projects where you want to keep track of who is currently signing for this release. Um, and also just you want more control over, over the process. It's also good for unlisted packages, so kind of these private packages that might not be covered by the registry's top level targets metadata, but is still kind of listed on the registry. And this can provide the client a way to list public keys for those files as well, and kind of work with the security measures of the top level roles of TUF, the root timestamp and snapshot roles, but provide kind of a separate chain of trust for um, specific targets. Another new feature for um, Node v 2 that we've been discussing is this idea of succinct hash bin delegations, which is um, kind of a, a way to reduce the size of delegations. Um, especially, this is especially useful for um, larger public registries where a lot of the packages are signed by the registry itself and not offline by developers. Um, and in this case, the, the registry can sign, can automatically sign for these images using online keys by, um, by separating the, the packages into bins based on the hash. And this just reduces the size of the metadata when you're doing a lot of online signatures um, for, for, again, for those really large public registry use cases. So if you'd like to learn more um, about TUF, we have our, our website, as well as the specification, which goes into a lot more detail about how the, all of the aspects of the system work. There's also a reference implementation for TUF um, which you can find from the website, or you can contact me and I can get that to you. We're also available on the, the CNCF Slack. Um, we have a couple of channels, one uh, the Tough channel, as well as the um, Python Tough channel, where we talk about, you know, the reference implementation specifically. Um, for the Node v 2 this is an ongoing design process. So if you have any interest in secure distribution, this is kind of, I think, a good, great place to get involved. We have, we're on the CNCF Slack and, um, a lot of the work that I've presented here is included in a tough prototype design um, piece, which is, is there's a link to here. Um, and yeah, we'd love to work more with, with folks and see how we can solve all of our use cases and get everyone's packages signed um, on registries. And so feel free to email me or contact me on the CNCF Slack and I will be available live for questions. Thank you everyone.